recording. All right. Okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ki Jin Song, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher in the Urban Information Lab at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, welcome to our lightning talk series on the smart city research. So this talk series is funded by the UT's Good System Project. So we invited speakers from academia, industry, and communities to share the research events and the needs related to the smart cities. Um, so if you are interested in this topic, then please feel free to visit our website for our past talks and other activities at smartcity.tech.utexas.edu. So today, uh, we are very excited to have Dr. Yang Song as our guest speaker. Um, Dr. Yang Song is an assistant professor in the Department of Landscape Architecture and Urban Planning at Texas A&M University. He completed both his PhD and his MLA graduate studies at Clemson University. Um, he worked at the intersection between the landscape architecture, community planning, and urban design. Um, his academic activities have a strong focus on the role of public spaces in community health and resiliency. Um, he has a long-standing interest in applying digital technology and data science in landscape research and design. And he studies the usage of urban public spaces and develops human-based de design theories that enhance the active living and economic resilience. His design and research work have been recognized by multiple national and international awards, including the Honor of Research Awards from American Society of Landscape Architects and the Excellence of Research Certificate from the Environmental Design and Research Association. So today, um, he will talk about understanding long-term place-based behavior through the smart city mobility data, smartphone mobility data, I'm sorry. <laughs> so without further ado, I'll pass the mic to Dr. Song. Oh, thank you, thank you for the introduction. Well, uh, so I can sh share a screen now, okay, share a screen. Okay. Um, um, okay, I'll put my slides up, um, go to, it's good. Can you see the screen? Yes, we can see the full okay. screen now. Okay, thank you. Um, hopefully, um, you can see the text, things like that. Um, um, I think today I just would love to share uh, with some um recent uh interest that I have. Um, in terms of I'm always kind of interested on public spaces and the cities and uh, um urban areas and um. I, I have a strong feeling that different kinds of places, people have different kinds of behaviors attached to that, uh, some irregularities and uh, um, kind of trying to find out, okay, what is the patterns that are um, uh, related with different kind of place types. Um, and as, as, of course, as landscape architect, I'm uh, uh, for, very interested in parks because I think uh, in urban areas really like, um, um, you have roads, you have parks, and then other land or properties are owned by um, uh, private private owners. So usually parks and roads are um, operated through um, the government or public domain. Um, so so uh, I, I will today I probably quickly show you uh, two studies because the time I probably um, the second study probably runs through a little bit quick quickly, but. Um, uh, this is the first one is about uh, park visitations um, using smartphone data. Um, so basically when we look at the parks there, um, it's actually, it's, inter it's interesting. It's actually where there's some questions that were based, I think it's very basic, simple questions, but it's actually very hard to get. For example, how many people visit park, how frequent they go to park, like where they come from, how long they stay in the park and who are the people visit the park. Um, you know, some for some big cities like um, um, the park and rec department, they have the resources to 
learn these questions. They can do surveys. They can do site observations. They can do automatically uh, count people, like laser counting, that kind of uh, sensor to do that. But for uh, mid-site city, like College Station, like Texas A&M is, uh, the pack, a, a lot of uh, park and rec department, they don't uh, really um, um, know those, those questions. Um, and it's really hard for them to kind of um, know, OK, which part need to be improvement, need to be rede redesigned, things like that. Um, so um, basically, the, the research gap uh, on this one is basically um, it's expensive just to know this kind of information, behavior, user behavior information, uh, and especially for mid-sized cities, because most of cities in the U.S. are actually mid-sized cities. It's uh, like 70 um thousand to two hundred thousand population those are uh majority of number of cities there's um you know i think there's 800 or two thousands of those cities um and and also it's very difficult to kind of learn user behaviors um in a long-term large-scale way so um that's you know what the secondary data the big data come in um uh, can fill that gap i think it's um uh, it's a really good uh, way to do that. Um, and also, you know, the data collection time frame is usually varies. You know, um, like some um, cities, they, you know, they only collect user data for that specific week or specific months. Um, or, or sometimes they collect data yearly, but they kind of a sample like, okay, this month that we collect like a two, you know, several days to, you know, sample. Um, but it's really rarely that you can collect like every single day. Right? I think that's another benefit of big data or um, like smart city um, um, to to do that. I, I think like a cell phone, um, you know, you use humans as sensors, um, you know, you, you, you footprint of their behaviors. They, they live that information every day. Um, so that's a good, very good way. I think it's a very good way to kind of learn um, how people go to different places, um, where they're from, um, um, you know, the, the, to learn the, their mobilities and then from mobility, you kind of learn their preferences, um, their behaviors spatially. Um, so this, you know, it just, just, um, this is just a photo to show, uh, uh, the inspiration. So, um, I came up, I came from this, um, this data is called Safe Graph. It's a mobility data. I think a lot of you probably already know from it. Um, it's um, cell phone data. I first came up with data during COVID. I think they kind of, uh, COVID is really um, uh, bring a lot of opportunity to like researchers um, for this, this is a private company. They kind of share that to academics trying to learn the behaviors around uh, COVID time. So, um, it, it's basically what they do is they basically in a nutshell they just share it with you um, basically two pieces of data one is they tell you the places they automatically they have some AI uh, algorithm to kind of automatically detect different places um, so they draw a polygon of every in this case the parks they draw a polygon of every parks um, um, and then for every parks because they have a polygon, and then they also have data from um, some pri uh, uh, providers like um, uh, AT&T or Verizon. Um, so they know, you know, the GPS um, records. So they basically know whether or not this phone uh, move into that polygon. So they are, then they automatically aggregate the data and tell you, basically tell you, you know, weekly, um, this, how many people go to this park and uh, which block group that people from. Um, so I think the unit is uh, from the um, the source, uh, it, it, think about it as a trip, right? There's a so uh, source, source and destination. The source is a block group and the destination is the POI, which in this case is parks. Um, and they offer, um, you know, weekly uh, information on that. Um, so basically, I uh, kind of download those data and collect them. Um, and uh, the issue with this kind of data is it's not um, perfect <laughs> in, a, in a sense, because um, sometimes the park um, are not a real park. It's uh, called a research park or, uh, you know, 
some like industry park and then they categorize them as park because you know everything's automatic so there's no um human in the loop on this one uh, but they're getting better and better so um in college station so i found like about 28 parks um that is very good um and i have very have the whole time period covered that i want um it's about two year of time period it's um uh, january um 19 to november 2020 um so you know um this my community park the 19 neighborhood park associated with it um so in this the map of college station and the um the green dot are the neighborhood park and the the symbol of the trees that's uh community park so usually that's two type of park and that's very different uh they have different goals serve different people um different sides so that's why i kind of categorize them that way um so this is about like a uh, 110,000 uh rows of data that are collected uh from there um again so um to to do this kind of data, you first need to do some like collect data collection. You collect data. You need to do some uh, processing, manipulation. Um, one major thing we need to do is kind of to um, um, estimate uh, the 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 park visitation because um, um, the the and you, you have to understand the sampling too. So because um, for privacy reason. Um, there's no way you get everybody's phone data um, from that blog group and go to that park. So basically what they tell you is, okay, um, how many phones go into that um, uh, that park? But the, the benefit is once you know the phone, um, how many phones they collect, you know the sampling rate. The good part about this data is the sampling rate is it's changing, right? It, it's um, It changed through time you cannot like uh, keep the same but it randomly sample them um about you know 10 percent if you check the kind of the the um the mean from it um the median mean um i, I just i forgot it's a median mean but it's about 10 percent um so i think it's a very good sampling rate is in, in terms of capture um the behavior of the whole population at least in this case the college station um uh, so one thing you can do with this kind of study is, of course, you can know the longitudinal changes uh, through the way. And, um, you know, there's some season, sometimes there's seasonal, uh, seasonal, uh, seasonality associated with it. Uh, one interesting thing is you can, uh, I don't know what, how you can see my uh, mouse, but um, if you look at October, you'll find out there was a spike on October in both year, uh, both 2020 and 19. So I think that's part of regular um, seasonality. Um, and also uh, another interesting thing is you find out there's a huge um, increase on park visitation during the summer um, in 2020. I, I, I think most reason is because of COVID. Um, you know, usually in, in towns, uh, college town like college station, usually in the summer people kind of go travel or um, the uh, schools out and they um, so usually there's not much thing going on in the town but uh, 2020 is a different uh, it's a little bit different uh, and it's also very hot usually people don't go to park um, when it's super hot uh, but 2020 is an exception because uh, uh, there's where there's few indoor activities there's travel ban uh, actually um, for several a couple of weeks um, during that time too um so, so COVID is still a big thing uh, during 2020. Of course, yeah, it's, it's 2020. So, and also the other thing you could do, you can check like a difference between weekend days and weekdays. So you can see um, uh, how they're, the park's being used. So typically for quality station, you know, um, you know, weekly, it's, if you add them together, it's about, you know, for, um, it's about 100, 100, um, it's, it's about like 100, you know, um, people visit them um, per week if you add weekdays and uh, weekend days together. So, so somewhere popular parks, you have like a 200 to 300 um, people. So just give you guys a sense like a, uh, the usage rate, right? Um, if you look at like, for example, um, uh, I don't know, like chicken filet, for example, they they can have like, uh, um, you know, 500 
a week, but um, you know, sometimes five hundred a day. So that's just just give you like some different. So like a Walmart, for example, you have have sometimes you can have like ten thousand a week. So, um, but a park is still, I think, you have a lot of exposure to the public. Okay, if you look at it, it's not it's still a lot of people. Um, um, and the other thing you could do is you can map like okay, which park are more popular than others. Um, of course, it's from the sides of dots you can see. You know, um. Usually the, the the community park have more people going there, but still some community park, uh, some neighborhood park have a lot of people go there too. So, um, this I think um, uh, College Station have a lot of neighborhood kind of spread out, and then uh, for some neighborhood park, uh, they're doing really really well and being used a lot. Um, and the other thing is, uh, if you look at the photo on the right side. You can actually map, um, you know, which block group, how many people go to this park, and um, uh, and you can like uh, you see the two parks, uh, the Southern Oak Park and the Western uh, uh, Western Park. Um, you can map them, and you can see how um, uh, the pattern is, um, and you kind of check them, you know, how they serve uh, different. Um, people. One thing that's interesting is South Southern Oak Park. I look at this park. You can find out a lot of people from the north part of town go to the south part here. Um, I I don't really understand that part that part because this is a um, neighborhood park, and then I go to that park and then check out. Okay, they they have a um, the yoga class, yoga business class um, going going around there, and then um, it, um, it's actually happened every week, and then. Um, there's a guy, you know, put their speakers and put a lot of, so there's a lot of people, you know, from the town in the north come down there. Um, um, the other thing you could check is the distance of travel. One thing, interesting thing is um, you find out there's a huge differences on different um, distances as they travel. Um, I didn't include some parks on there because some parks are not very popular. They're parks, um, they're only, like people only travel 900 feet. To go to that park, so it doesn't serve that well that much long distance. But some park, like a, a Richard Carter Park, you know, by the way, these meters people travel like five miles, four miles to go to that park. So you really serve a wide range of people. Um, considering your know, college station is not that big, you know, so it's really search serve a really long distance of um, wide range of people. Um, of course, this changed through different cities. But one thing, one interesting thing is uh, distance is different. You know, um, every park is different. Um, um, and then you can do statistical analysis, trying to find out, identify, okay, which factors are more important. And so you can, you know, I in this case, I run, um, it's a longitudinal data. You have to do some panel uh, analysis. So in this case, I run, uh, I use fixed effects. You kind of control time and the places um some unobserved uh, variables trying to control them um one one interesting thing i i add in there is design features because landscape architecture you know you usually put some design features on there so like water features plant, uh, flo planting bed or um decorative things uh, sculptures things like that um and then you can you know check the tables right the coefficient and you'll find out okay COVID is very important driver of the visit of course it is uh, and then water bodies are really important um you have more you have a lake you have a stream um you have a river um it helps a lot uh, to a lot of people go there um um go to go there and playgrounds super important it's actually one of the most important uh, facilities um if you have a playground way more people go there and temperature if the temperature going higher people want you to go there more um um and then you know the and the negative part is on the right side right um one interesting thing is income is not um higher income people actually go less um to to the park um of course the rain is the most important part of it is raining. Nobody will go there. Distance, of course, the further the distance, the less they go. Um, so conclusions. Um, you know, in a nutshell, basically, there's two things I would get get out of this. Is I think one thing is the facilities. We can really identify. Okay, for this city at this point of time, what facilities really drive the visitation, the usage. And also another thing interesting I find out is the distance traveled for parks, which is these slides. It's basically. Usually, when people planning for parks, you know, like um, like the the map them right, they just 
I, I teach plan, um, landscape planning classes, you know, we, we draw bubble diagrams, right? We have a lot of concepts like 15 minute cities, things like that, right? But actually it's not, for parks, not eco, you know, some parks, you know, um, they have, they have playgrounds. Some parks, they don't have playgrounds. Some parks, they have a basketball court. Some might only have a tennis court. So you really need to think about through facilities, not think about parks. Um, so that's just another part of it. Um, okay, so I don't know whether I'm short on time, but um, I can go through this really quickly. Um, then I do another study to look at, uh, okay, how COVID impact campuses in Texas. So I basically, um, I collect three universities, Texas A&M, UT Austin, Texas Tech. Um, so basically the question I ask is very simple. I just want to know um, whether or not po after COVID, you know, 2021, fall semester, everything go to normal. The vaccine rate is 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 hot. It's already, you know, every most people have um, uh, vaccinated. So do you, people, you know, still go to campus as before. Um, so, you know, the data, right? I collect, you know, the, the, the libraries, the restaurants, some some available POIs on campuses. Um, there's UT Austin and yeah, UT Austin there. Tell me, tell me, tell me if I, I'm wrong there. Um, you know, you can just do some descriptive analysis. You know, okay, you know, all the direction on the left, which means this decrease, right? So based, I use 19 as a base baseline. You find out, okay, 20, which is the red color, of course, you know, the decrease the usage of those places. Um, but the blue is 2021, you know, it, you, you can see still it's decreasing, especially UT Austin. Yeah, and this is where it is the most significant on uh, all three universities. Um, they're, they're, the places there are are less used more, um, um, even definitely not as the same extent as 2020, but it's still where not as used much as before. Um, a lot of campus um, locations. Um, and, and and I just did like some kind of a kind of so-called natural experiment for that, right? I'm um, trying to control um, some variables and the control variable, treatment variables, things like that, and then trying to see whether or not there's any um, differences associated with it, and then um, just run, run some statistics. And uh, you can find, of course, you know, 2021, um, Compared to 19, 2021 is very significant, which means, you know, people still don't go to campus as much as before. Um, and then you can look at some in, uh, interaction terms, right? You can look at whether or not green spaces make a factor or walk, walkable distance make a factor. It turns out um, post-COVID, you know, the, the after COVID, um, um, it have more impact on the people live around the campus versus people live further to the campus. So that's just, and that's just a finding down there. Um, and then, of, of course, you can find di for different specific places, right, um, whether or not significant. So you, it, it turns out, you know, it's food, drinking is basically, you know, like the restaurant in campus or the sports uh, recreation, like the parks in campus or gyms in campus. Those two places are significant. So basically, uh, COVID have strong impact on those places and also the distances um, um, you know, what, what I call walkable distances, right? The interaction effect of walkable distances have impact on these two type of places too. Um, uh, okay, so sorry to go through this one really quickly with the time, um, um, but uh, I think that's all I have today. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you. It's so, yeah, it was a very <laughs> fascinating talk, yeah. I'll wait to see if there is any questions from the audience. Um, but um, I want to throw out two questions first, <laughs> actually, because um, I'm not familiar with the smartphone mobility data in the US. Um, I have a, a three questions on the data sort, the safe graph. Sure. Um, sure. So are they, uh, are the uh, weekly based time frame is the smallest unit that you can collect or do they also provide any real time or near real time data as well? Um, I don't think they have real time. They have an API, um, but different based on their 
you know, whether or not they're open to the public. And there, there's a paid version also the one okay. another version for the public, the like a, a, academics for research. So I don't think for research they they kind of give uh, access um, for like a real time. Mm -hmm. um, they do release new data, I think uh, quarterly or monthly. Uh, previously it's monthly, right now it's probably quarterly. And um, um, they kind of, was COVID faded, um, mm -hmm. they kind of, um, um, the, the, the access level, of the data is, is kind of decreasing, I find out that. So, um, but, but yes, they don't, I don't think they provide real time um, data for that. And it's a weekly, I think weekly is the most accurate. They they have a little bit like a, a daily uh, or even hourly, mm -hmm. but the issue is the accuracy and um, they themselves even working on it and um, kind, of, kind of admit like a, a, the accuracy on it. The other issue with this kind of data is the, um, like for example, in college, uh, in Austin, there's a lot of high rises. It is really hard for them to understand. Okay, whether or not it's first floor, or second floor, um, you know. Uh, so, like in one building, high rise building, they probably, um, you know, they don't know which one you go. So that's another issue you have to uh, kind of deal with. But I think there are definitely ways to um, work on it. Yeah. So in your research design, maybe the weekly data would be the best uh, appropriate time framework rather than the hourly or the daily data aggregation, right? Um, yes, the mo uh, most reason behind that is the me their methodology because, um, you know, they get those signals from like uh, uh, towers, right? Like cell phone towers. And the cell phone towers, they, <clears throat> they vibrate. The signal vibrates. Sometimes that's why you know a lot of GPS data, even like um like here at Texas AM, they do like a GPS data trying to track people's usage, and then you find out like the GPS data like kind of vibrate back and forth. Um so and they um so sometimes you you need a longer enough to kind of um filter the noise from there. That's one thing. The other thing is um safe grab of a company like I think most of the cell phone data, they intentionally provide, uh, give like a um, noise over the data. So they intentionally make the data not 100% correct mm -hmm. for that hourly. The reason is the privacy reason. What if there's hourly, only one people go there and that people from a blog group, only one people there. So then you know where what that people yeah. is and that kind of thing. So they intentionally do that. And the other thing they do is, if like a blog group, they only find out, okay, that blog group only have four people, less than four people go there. Like for example, two people go go to a POI. It can be like a restaurant or something like that. They always count as four. That's another issue they have. So you kind of need to deal with those things um, um, on that. So this is, yeah, there's some like a details on, on, on how they structure the data, how they collect the data. But I, I would say, um, the larger the scale, the longer the time frame, the more accurate it is. Okay. Um, I know, like, uh, like for example, a lot of national park, like Yellowstone, right now, they're using this to kind of track uh, their visitation. They're actually looking at monthly. Um, it's just because they know they know exactly how many people go there um, because they're national park, right? So they find mm -hmm. it out monthly is kind of most reliable in terms of um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. And um, I have a, one another question for sure, the sure, first sure. study. Um, so how did you control the COVID issues and the modeling for the um, park vegetation? Because uh, we also had some similar issues uh, in our own research when collecting the data, such as the census, EMS, or others during the COVID. So, I'd like to hear about your approaches, how to handle the COVID issues. Oh, uh, I don't know whether or not I'm doing that right, but I have, because uh, it's the longitudinal data. So, basically, every week uh, there's a row, right? Um, so, I just make if this time, basically, I check the timeline of the COVID and you know, I just check the date that like we have a national, we announced national, declare a national emergency. Um, after that date, for those data, I count as one and then 
um, then it's zero. So it's pre and post. I just count that as a variable. And if that variable is significant, I think, you know, those rows are um, during COVID are uh, a higher than or lower than the ones that are not after controlling all other variables. I think um, the benefit of this kind of data is if you have some, um, it's longitudinal, which means it's panel data, which means you have some information that is unobserved. Like for example, I, I cannot, like for park visitation, I cannot collect all the information, right? Some some parks, you know, I collect some like a, I collect like these are the facilities I have, but there are definitely more, you know, uh, some parks have like a frisbee golf. I don't know. I don't know how large they are. And some parks have, um, you know, campgrounds. So those kind of things. So, but the good part is if they have a campground, they have a campground all the time, um, doing mm -hmm. all my, all my time. And so, um, and I collect them multiple times. I'm all I checking, you know, is how they change. Um, so they, a lot of those effects, unobserved effects are canceled. So. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Does there is there any other questions? Yeah. So hi, Doctor Song. Hi. <laughs> hi. Um. Thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. Um, you're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah. Um. I have a question about your data site. Uh, data source. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Like uh, for example, the uh, for users like um. Uh, traveling to the parks, like some people may not have a phone or may not bring their phones, like some mm -hmm. case. So I think this may be uh may cause some bias. Um, my question is like I I think you 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 mentioned the sample sample right? Did you use it to like infer the actual um park users or um you use any other like methods to infer like? The real amount of people from one block to, uh, this to this park. Um. So basically, um, the sample size. Um, I actually my um, I um, cause I know the sample size and then I know the from census. That's another issue actually from here is, um, cause I know the sample size. I know the census, the total population. Then I just calculate uh, estimate. Okay, what's the real visitation of that? Um. But I think that's a great question. But there's issues with that. What I find out is, um, like even in College Station, for example, Texas AM, it's not correct. Um, the census is often not correct for college towns. Um, it's um, you know, one block group. There are way more students than their census tell you. Um, so I find out, you know, college towns like uh, some hospital block groups. So those are the issues um, I find in it. So um, for those places, probably it's not correct. I don't think it's correct. Um, so I think that's a limitation. Um, and also, like you said, what if you don't have phones? You, there's no way you cap capture those people uh, using this kind of data. Um, like a lot of older people or younger children, or they don't have phones. So that's kind of another you're you're totally right. That's a limitation. <laughs> That's yeah. really a limitation on there. So you will probably need to interpret this data with some um, um, careful interpretation uh, to understand. Okay, what are the possible risk um, of of the result? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Okay. <laughs> Very interesting <laughs> discussion. And um, I think we are already at the time to wrap up. So yeah, I want to stop here. So if you have any more questions, then feel free to reach out to Dr. Song. And also you can feel free to send us an email Then we are happy to connect with you, Dr. Song as well. And oh, anytime, yes. We're we're very close. So <laughs> I go to Austin a lot. <laughs> nice. Yeah. And yeah. All right. So thank you so much, Dr. Song, for your wonderful talk today. And yeah, we'll post your video on our website soon. 
And for everyone, um, if you are interested in our future talks, then you are welcome to visit our website at smarts.utexas.edu to see our past recordings and other, other information for future talks. And this talk was the last event of the spring semester. So uh, maybe our next smart talk series will continue on the fall. So thank you everyone for joining the talk today. And yeah, I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend. You too. Have a great weekend. Happy Friday. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye.